Jerry Haynes, who I think almost all of you know, have, for more than 20 years has single-handedly put together the work, the delegations that have gone to Gaza. Um, over 20 delegations over years, starting with the Middle East and more recently to Gaza. Gaza, uh, Jerry is a um, Jerry is an inspiration to all of us. She and her husband Bob uh, illustrate illustrate service with a capital S uh, in terms of the work that they've done, particularly beginning with with the issue of the tinderbox of the Middle East, but more recently the humanitarian aspects of Gaza. So Jerry is one of our our very proud leaders in the organization. He's a member of our board, and I would like to turn the program over to Jerry to take it from there. Jerry. It's an honor to be here today. Can you hear me? OK. So thank you very much for being here. We have a number of people in the room who have traveled with us to Gaza. And I would like you to raise your hands, please. Check that out. And I want to tell you that these people take their vacation to go to Gaza. They pay their own way, they pay their own room and board, and they give freely of their talents and their energy in a place that is a challenge to the world. So I thank you all very much for doing what you do. I am humbled by you. I don't know, for me, it's a different story in some ways. I'm addicted to going there, and so I just go because I need to hear the call to prayer or whatever I go there I I love it but I want to just do a little bit of review for you as Bruce told you we are a member of the National PSR which is in Washington DC which is a member of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War back in the early 90s we were invited by the Israeli chapter of IPPNW to come to um, the Middle East to Israel to talk with them about what was happening in Dimona, which is the Israeli nuclear plant. And they had deep and abiding concerns about what was going on there. Because of various things, um, we kind of got on to do this trip on our own. And we traveled into the region in January of 1993. In that trip, we went into the West Bank, and then we went into Gaza. And in Gaza, we met an extraordinary human being, Dr. Ia Del Siraj, who was the child psychiatrist who started the Gaza Community Mental Health Program. Iyad then traveled here. He traveled to Mexico. He visited us, and we continued to visit with him for a long period of time. He died a year ago in December but he is an inspiration ongoing to us because of his wisdom and his energy. In 2009, following Operation Cast Lead, Iyad invited us to come, hi Cindy Corey. Um, Iyad invited us to come to Gaza to do medical work. And so we did, because most of our previous trips had been fact-finding. But he said to us, our medical community is suffering so much, we really need some help. We need the energy, we need the inspiration, we need the care that you can bring as taxpayers of the United States to come to visit us and work in Gaza. So we did. And in November of this last year, we made our eighth such medical mission journey into Gaza um, since October of 2009. We're motivated. We want to keep going back. And right now, we're waiting for permission from Israel to enter Gaza again next month. Today, you will hear from people who have served in Gaza, who also love Gaza, and love the idea that we get to go there and represent the people of the United States who want justice and peace and a sense of humanity to survive in the world. So the first person that you're going to hear from is this cute guy right here <laughs> that I get to be married to. 
and this is Bob Haynes, and he's going to tell you about it. Yeah, I would have, I would have definitely felt slighted if I hadn't any applause when they applaud for my wife. I don't know. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for coming on this beautiful Sunday. Um, I'm going to do about 60 seconds of the cardiology part of what I do, uh, which is advanced cardiac life support, which is uh, a very hands-on type of thing to learn how to keep someone alive who has had a cardiac arrest. And these uh, people in Gaza cannot leave Gaza right now under siege. Uh, they cannot come and go uh, as physicians, as professionals who want to learn more about such things as advanced cardiac life support. Uh, so instead, I come to them and teach this course, and it's a delight to do so. There are nurses, medical students, uh, doctors, and, and uh, medical staff. It's, uh, it's quite fun, and I'd love to talk to you about it sometime. Uh, but but that's not what I'm going to do. Instead, at this point, I'm going to show a little movie that Jerry Gaza is about the length of Lake Washington. It houses over 1.8 million people. Because the security zone has been widened independently by Israel from the security zone that existed after Oslo, the amount of land now available to the people of Gaza grows smaller and smaller and so many people of Gaza are still out of housing since the 2014 war that across the little region, people are challenged to find a place to live, to find heat, to find food, to survive. So we're lucky today, again, to have people with us who have been to Gaza and understand some of what's happening there. Um, in the back, I'd like Craig and Cindy Corey to stand. Thank you for coming here from Olympia. Craig and Cindy are heroes of our time. Craig and Cindy are heroes of our time. Thank you. And here's another one. Dr. Charles Cohen is the medical director of the Autism Center at Children's Hospital. He's been my buddy for a long time. He tolerates me when we travel. I'm grateful to him. And um, here he's going to tell you about his work among a population that was kind of a surprise to us. Uh, thank, thank you, Jerry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, my god. I was sitting in the front row, and all of a sudden, the room is entirely filled including some very special people in the back of the room. Laura, Rich. Um, so I'm very excited to be here, um, excited to be part of this enterprise. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a strange subject um, that, um, uh, that I was participating in a year ago in, in April when I was in Gaza with, with Jerry and, and colleagues. So um, a little bit about myself. I'm a, I'm a pediatrician, um, developmental pediatrician. Uh, my area of interest is, is children that have disabilities. Um, and I have been interested in the problem of autism for many, many years, um, probably 20 years now. I've been fortunate enough to um, have many colleagues at the University of Washington at Seattle Children's to help, and we have built a, a, a very extensive program for this now common problem um, all over the world. But it surprised me that it was a problem that somebody was interested in in, the, in Gaza, considering what you've all seen. There, there really seem to be much higher priorities to deal with than what amounts to a, a fairly uh, small population. It turns out that uh, autism is a, is a pretty common problem, and it's a common problem all over the world. It accounts for about 1% um, of the population, which is quite, quite big. And so uh, maybe three years ago, uh, Jerry began to um, harangue me, as she's able to do so effectively, that, that people um, in Gaza, we're saying that they have a lot of children that seem to be autistic and they know nothing about it. And she knew that that was an area of interest of mine and was hoping that I would, uh, would be able to join one of the delegations. In fact, 
I had planned to um, go the previous year and then last minute travel disasters with airlines made it impossible. I was greatly disappointed. So I was excited to be able to go this past year and um, part of the team that's planning to go again next year. So um, with, with the proviso, we, we've been sitting around as a group saying, you know, does this make any sense? Why are we dealing with this kind of uh, somewhat obscure, rare problem, given all the other issues that are much higher priority um, in, in the Gaza Strip? And frankly, we've, the, those of us uh, that are part of our team have been discussing this repeatedly for quite a while, saying, is this really valuable? Why are we doing this? And I think the answer that we've come to for ourselves is it's valuable because this is what people here have asked us to do. It's something that we know how to do. And that every little step, every little step of making people's lives better, um, which doesn't address housing, doesn't address energy, doesn't address water, doesn't address any of the other issues that you just saw in this film, um, is still important and valuable. So this is why we're going is is to be able to help delivering something that we know how to do. So I'm going to t show you some, some pictures. Um, uh, to start out, uh, these four lovely ladies who are, are uh, people that work for the Gaza Community Mental Health uh, Program, which is GCMHP, is our sponsor that invites us to, the, to Gaza. It's an organization that, that Iyad El Siraj formed many years ago, and, and they're, they're our bedrock. They're the folks that arrange all of our interpreters and travel and, and visits with various organizations. So um, uh, Jerry's shown you some pictures. I, of course, have pictures. These were some of the members of our team when, when I was there in April 2014. Uh, next picture. And other members, uh, one of the key people is this uh, man in the upper right-hand corner, Marwan uh, uh, Diab, who was our extraordinary host of many that, that managed to take us all over the place. And in the lower right corner, I'm, um, I'm meeting with a group of families with my interpreter, Mustafa. Next slide. So these were some of the things that we got to do. I was actually, when I arrived, I didn't expect to have a um, very organized schedule, but, but uh, the people organized multiple meetings, and, and I ended up working from early morning to late at night, uh, meeting with various folks, ranging from giving talks at the medical school to meeting with groups of parents to um, uh, going everywhere that I could that I was invited. Next. So I'm going to tell you some observations, but I have this, this kind of caution that, you know, I, I've done work overseas, mostly in Southeast Asia, and um, uh, my experience tells me that you go to an unusual uh, culture and country and think that you know what's going on there and in fact uh, may not know at all. So these are based on limited observations from a visit of 10 days, meeting with a lot of different people, but I will acknowledge that I may have missed uh, major, major issues and we're going to try and learn from our next, next trip going forward. Next slide. Uh, more, more, more photos. Um, you know, the, the colorful dress and the smiles on people's faces when you, when you greeted them is, is such an important message about the resilience of the people that live in Gaza. Um, one would think people are wandering around um, with sad faces, and they're not. They're, they're happy, and they were so happy to see us. I mean, that was one of the things that's most heartwarming about going to this place. Next. So um, we tried to figure out what the situation was, what, what um, is uh, the issue of, of uh, this childhood, this devastating childhood disability um, in, in a place like Gaza. And it turns out that it's just the same as every other place in the world. The kids that I saw were the same as the kids that I see at Children's Hospital in Seattle. Um, because it's, the condition is worldwide, um, apparently increasing in uh, prevalence, though that's still unclear, and very troubling because it's a very severe disabling problem for, for many families who are already burdened with all kinds of other huge issues. Um, people wanted to know why this was happening, and of course the first answer was, well, it's because we've been bombed by, by Israel and um, and curiously, the other question that uh, came up as a cause for autism was um, uh, people 
um, are having their children, their young children, sit in front of television sets all day long because there's nothing else to do. And they wondered whether those two things were the cause of autism, and I had to tell them that that was not true because the same thing is happening in France and, uh, and India and China, everywhere in the world. So part of the things that I learned was to try to understand what people's understanding for a condition were and then try to um, help them understand that there were other causes. Next. Um, the other thing that I learned was that, um, that the process of understanding to a large extent is based on um, some wrong assumptions, um, things that the that, uh, um, professional community, which is really highly educated, have learned from the internet or other sources. So there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of wasted energy, unfortunately, doing tests um, that are not very helpful to make a diagnosis and don't help people understand who their children are and what their problems are. So that was another whole area of understanding that I learned from, from this visit. Next slide. Um, uh, this was an example of uh, some of the talks that I gave. Um, uh, this was a room full of uh, excited, enthusiastic, mostly professionals, teachers, social workers, uh, speech therapists who wanted to understand about this because this was an important part of their, their reality, their, their professional lives. Next. Um, so aside from recognizing that there was a, there, and the reason why I'm telling you this is this kind of leads into what we're hoping to do, that one of the big areas where, we, where there was a fair amount of what we thought misinformation was about the whole assessment diagnostic process it was skewed in the wrong direction, and that in order to provide effective treatment, one has to have reasonably effective and correct diagnostic process. So we essentially identified that this is a big problem. Next. Um, for those of you that haven't seen what a refugee camp in, uh, in the Gaza Strip looks like, um, this is uh, one of the refugee camp uh, with streets that are narrow enough that barely one person can, can get through. Um, and um, though there, there are multiple refugee camps throughout the Gaza Strip, these are the areas where people first resettled in 1948. Um, and some people have lived there for now three or four generations. Other people have been able to move out into the general community. and. Um, our notion of a refugee camp is something that has a wall around it or, or barriers, and that's not the case. It's just an area within a city. So we also asked people, what are they worried about with their kids? And these were the kind of list of kind of problem behaviors that are the same kind of problem behaviors of children that have this disorder in the United States. So again, another example that there's nothing different. Their kids were hyperactive, and they cried a lot, and they couldn't communicate, and they were viewed as, as, um, as uh, big, big burdens. But the other thing that was so apparent was, was the love and tenderness that people um, showed with their children repeatedly again and again. It was just quite extraordinary, even children that were behaving in a very, very difficult fashion. Next. I'm sorry? Oh, uh, self-injurious behavior, hurting themselves, sorry. Um, it's another behavior that uh, autistic children do. They bang their head and hit, it, hit themselves and hurt other people, not because they want to, because they don't know what to do. Sorry, some of these talks, I give these to talks to autism uh, professional types, and I use some, some of my bad jargon there, so thank you for correcting me. Um, there is one agency uh, in the Gaza Strip, one uh, non-governmental agency, NGO, um, that was just getting started when we were there in April, um, called the Palestinian Society for Autism Rehabilitation. Um, but for a population of 1.8 million with um, what one would guess uh, were, um, what's 1% 1 of 1.8, it's 180,000 people that if we used American statistics, there are 180,000 people with autism spectrum disorders in the Gaza Strip, if that's a reasonable estimate of the prevalence. Next. 
Another organization that we met with is called the Right to Live Society. It was an organization predominantly for children with mental retardation and Down syndrome that have now wanting to learn and take care of uh, children with autism because they recognize it a lot more. So there are folks in agencies uh, totally underfunded, um, uh, barely keeping it alive. Uh, uh, P um, the Right to Live Society, just next door to it, one of their buildings was, was bombed in the last war. Um, yet they're, they're, that's, what they want, that's what they do, and they're going to keep doing it. Next slide. Um, the, the treatment that was being uh, available for, for uh, children were uh, heavy use of very strong medications that are probably inappropriate, and a lot of strange therapies that um, have no benefit. Um, but the standard treatment that we do in the U.S. and in other parts of the West are behavioral treatments and education, and those services were, for the most part, with a few exceptions, not available. PSAR has a pilot program that they're going, serving about 60 kids out of 180,000. So, um, Next. Um, these were some of the strange therapies that uh, uh, parents had been convinced to give, do one called bee sting therapy, where bees were placed on the face, particularly under the eye of children. It was a way to presumably stimulate the immune system. We don't know where this notion came from. Um, or uh, uh, um, a whole lot of therapies that were kind of stuff that occur, that occur in sort of the unconventional literature of the US that, that kind of bled over in somewhat toxic fashion to the rest of the world, giving a lot of wrong information. Uh, next slide. Um, the educational system did not really necessarily have a organized structure for kids that were um, what we would call special education in the United States. The uh, educational system is predominantly, though very extensive, the Palestinians are a highly literate population. Uh, most of the education happens at home. Uh, children go to school half day, and then the uh, other half of the day they're, they're at home. Uh, and their parents are teaching. So that gave us some understanding that we need to really focus our efforts with the parent community. Next. The other thing that I'm used to in the US is that uh, for many health problems, there are organizations, you know, the Heart Association, the Cancer Association, the um, uh, you name it. And those kind of organizations, those advocacy um, Self-help uh, uh, support organizations do not seem to exist. So that was another area that we thought maybe this is something that we can do to help foster um, some kind of community around this problem because pe people sharing, um, sharing things between each other as parents are sometimes useful. So that, again, was highlighting what we could do next. Next. So here was one very exciting meeting. It was organized by uh, the uh, fathers of two children that I had seen previously in the week, and they called up their friends, and we had about 40 people in the room. And uh, they were mostly fathers, some mothers. Um, a big group discussion. It was quite extraordinary. Um, and I had been fortunate to have like three or four of those, which gave me some hope that, that maybe there's a nidus of a future parent organization that could be formed here, a parent support, advocacy kind of organization. We'll, we'll see. Next. Again, this was part of one of those meetings. And another, another one. Oops. Um, so uh, what's going to happen next? Um, uh, I've been meeting with a group of people from Seattle, from across the country, and internationally. Um, I wrote a blog uh, while I was there, and that got picked up by uh, uh, two uh, Palestinian uh, folks that are interested in autism, uh, one, one man that lives in, in Ottawa and another a woman that lives in D.C., and we've been meeting over Skype to plan, plan our next steps. We had a meeting just, just a little while ago with uh, Maxine Fuchsen, raise your hand, please, and Jim Mancini. Where's Jim? There he is. Jim, Jim is... Uh, is a speech therapist uh, that I work with at the Children's Autism Center, and he's joining us. And um, we have, depending upon how we count it, <laughs> another th three or four people that are going to be part of our team. And we're going to focus on um, two, two areas of training. Um, 
next. Uh, this is, these are the team members that are gonna be working on this issue when we go to Gaza. Next. And so uh, we're gonna focus on uh, trying to do some teaching around early intervention, early identification of problems and, and um, also on uh, basic behavioral interventions. We don't wanna just make diagnoses without offering people some kind of treatment and we wanna offer them treatment that can be done predominantly by parents or to some extent professionals that are, that are interested in it um, to uh, using what we hope is sort of a train the trainer model of finding people that are interested in pursuing it. One of the challenges for me um, is, is trying to sustain any healthcare efforts in Gaza when we're there for 10 days and come every six months to once a year, how do we, how do we sustain anything? And that's a real challenge and we, we acknowledge and recognize that. So um, what, what our team is gonna hope to do is, is to move forward. We have um, sort of modest expectations because there's a ho whole lot of unknowns when we show up there, but we're, gonna, we're still optimists. Um, I'm gonna uh, skip these next, the next slide because unless somebody, here, who reads Arabic here? <laughs> somebody <laughs> must read Arabic. Translated the yeah, we translated the MCHAT, thank you. Um, so this is a screening tool that's used in, in the West to assess possible autism and we have, through the help of Mohammed, uh, a, recent, um, a recent translation. So we're gonna try and use that as our focus for, um, for identification and diagnosis. Next. And then there's still a whole bunch of last minute things to do. We, again, we had a meeting this morning to focus on the, the training around in, in intervention, parent teaching, communication skills, et cetera, that Jim is, Jim is uh, volunteered to help lead. And I think that may be the last slide. <laughs> yep, sunset on the Mediterranean. Um, so thank you for your attention. We'll, we'll save questions for, for later on, but we'll be happy to entertain whatever questions you might have. Yeah. Dr. Laura Hart is an adult urologist with extensive international experience. Dr. Richard Grady is a pediatric urologist who holds hospital positions throughout the Northwest and has contributed extensively through his international work. Laura and Rich have served many times in Gaza and are here to tell you about their work. All right, well, I've, I've made this easy on everyone. I've brought no slides, uh, <laughs> just enthusiasm. The, yeah, I think you have, you know, for some of you, I know I've seen you before, you've been in the audience, you're familiar with this dilemma that we face uh, as a world, of what's going on in you know, Palestine and in Gaza. F for me, I'm a, I'm a children's plumber, a pediatric urologist, and I asked myself the same questions that you heard Chuck, Dr. Cowan asking, which is, for everything that's going on there and this level of destruction, what do I have to offer these people that could be of any value given the, you know, kind of ongoing grinding cataclysm that seems to be occurring over there. And for me, it was about creating hope. And for, for me, that meant finding a group of surgeons there who would work with us that we could create a skill set so that they would be able to take care of themselves. One of my favorite sayings so I wanted to be, I have an ongoing planned obsolescence so that the next time I would go back, they would be so well trained, they would be showing me how to do things and in a way in a better fashion than we do over here in the United States because we have this embarrassment of plenty here and they are doing so much with so little. So as much as I can uh, give them something when I go over, they give something back to me as well. So it's really become a two-way street. You, you have a sense of the physical structure of the place of Gaza from Jerry's talk. It's this uh, crumbling infrastructure, and that's also true in the healthcare setting as well. They're very limited in resources. 
we bring over what, what we can, uh, but what they make up for that is with their enthusiasm for, for the care that they can provide. And that's where uh, you know, our interest in coming back stems from. So when I go, I've been working with a, a group of surgeons with this idea that we would work together, take care of these children, train them, and then they would actually build their own educational structure. And uh, that's where being part of this group has been so satisfying to me because someone like Grant will join us as this group grows. And, and uh, working with Grant, we're now developing improvements in the way they uh, test the trainees that they have. And it creates enthusiasm among the people there who are in training as to what they're going to learn. One of the challenges the people in Gaza face is really being trapped in that area. And it's gotten worse, not better. You know, people have, now have a much more difficult time getting out. When I remember, when I went there for the first time, if you had the resources in Gaza, you could leave the country. And you might not get great care, but at least that, that care existed. You could go to Egypt, uh, or if, if the situation was right, you could get out to Jordan, or perhaps to Israel, to the other occupied territories. Now, when we talk, the families are really trapped in, in Gaza for the most part. So part of what we bring over there seems to be more important than ever as far as our ability to transfer our knowledge and transfer yeah, our, our hope that they will be able to take care of the children uh, and adults as well as, as we are over here. So I'm going to leave you with that small piece and uh, give you my wife. I truly have little to add to what Rich said. I made my first trip to Gaza in 2005 and I was with Jerry and Bob and a few others on our first true medical trip in 2009. And I, I, I'm an adult urologist and worked with a man, a wonderful man named Dr. Fayez Zatan, who kept bringing in patient after patient to see me with injuries from the recent war that had been then in early 2009, late 2008. And many of them were children, some with injuries from gunshot. And I kept thinking, how can I make that difference? I, it, I'm i not a trauma surgeon. I'm not a gifted trauma urologist either. Increasingly, I became it became clear that what he was fascinated with was taking care of children with problems. And I would say that it's pervasive in Gaza, and perhaps I would assert that in all the Arab world, children are incredibly valued. Not that we don't value them here. Children, then perhaps men, and women last. So something that I'm passionate about and had done a lot of volunteer work in other parts of the world with women's obstructive fistula and, and pelvic reconstruction isn't there in Gaza. It's not necessary to take care of those problems because they really do take care of women delivering babies. But the things that come later from having had eight deliveries, like leaky bladders, things like that, women are, it's still a dream that I have to create some kind of collaborative program uh, in pelvic floor medicine. And like Chuck alluded to, it's a challenge to come once or twice a year and really instill all that. But it's been phenomenal to be there to the first trip I took. I stayed a few extra days and got to really see how horrible how horrible it is for people. I lived in the home of someone who was desperately trying to leave at the Rafa border and was turned back from that border. The, and to be in that home and see that, that grief of wanting to get out and see her children. And since that first time visiting there, I feel very fortunate as each of the people who goes regularly to know families, and that's the biggest gift I receive. I receive far more each visit I make to Gaza than I've ever given. And I just thank all of you for your interest in being here, for the ongoing work that the delegations from Washington Positions for Social Responsibility have made possible. And I want to acknowledge Jerry. There, there are other people who tr desperately try, physicians who have tried to get into Gaza. It's not easy. It really takes something. And um, 
her uh, tenacious, tenacious, perhaps maybe bulldoggedness, and willingness to forego a lot of sleep have made it possible for us uh, to come back over and over so that I think everyone here today who's speaking holds that dream that we will support people who already have, they have their own tool set of, of brilliance and it's so different than any other place I've worked. But thank you. To put a, an, an exclamation point and a, a line underneath what Laura was, was just talking about, the, uh, the American delegations getting into Gaza are few and, and far between. Uh, I remember this, the, the last time I was in, uh, we were sitting with uh, the, 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 uh, one of the groups and they were commenting that they get delegations that come in from Europe regularly, uh, Sweden, a variety of different places. But the delegations to the United States that go into uh, uh, into Gaza are so uncommon. They said it's like it tastes so sweet when they see Americans and they walk in there and they realize that the entire United States is not against them and their hopes for trying to leave normal lives. So, thank you. One more person will talk. He's a gifted human being, Dr. Grant O'Keefe, professor in the Department of Surgery at the University of Washington. Grant's a trauma specialist and very popular in Gaza because, of course, trauma is a major problem in Gaza, and Grant's a great teacher. After Grant speaks, we'll do a little bit of um, conversation about maybe what you can do, and then also we'll have a question and answer part of what we're going to do, and Ned Roach and Maxine Fuchsen will join us because they were with us in November. And we, as I mentioned earlier, have applied to go back to Gaza. There are 19 of us waiting for permission to enter Gaza on the 20th of March next month. Uh, with all of that said, here's Dr. Grant O'Keefe. I'm, I'm humbled by uh, the people in the audience that I know and probably by many of you that I don't. Um, I've been to Gaza twice and um, despite my seeming experience, the, that's all the overseas medical relief work that I've done. Um, I find Gaza uh, incredibly stimulating and also incredibly exhausting. Um, I think perhaps Chuck expressed it, um, that it's, it's this overwhelming um, kind of emotional and physical kind of unending stimulation that for an introvert like me, it's, um, it's, it's, it's exhausting. Um, after about a week, I'm ready to come home, but as soon as we land, I'm ready to go back and um, I'm thrilled to be able to go back. Um, this is a little, a little different than what you've heard from, from Chuck and the others. Um, I think that, that on the surface of it, you might think that, um, and certainly when I was considering going there the first time, um, I was thinking, yeah, my skills as a trauma surgeon um, are perhaps going to be important there. Um, but it turns out that of many of my many skills, that's um, perhaps the least. Um, I think that, that there are so many things from a, from a surgical and medical care standpoint that, that the, the people of Gaza want and that they know that they need. Um, it's difficult to know where to start. Um, a little bit about me, I think, just to, to frame some of this. Um, that I'm probably the only uh, person who has um, certification as a general surgeon in Canada, the United States, and Gaza. Um, and I must say that perhaps the easiest place to get that certification was not Gaza. Um, <laughs> um, my first trip to Gaza was in April, uh, 
almost a year ago now. And um, can I have the next slide? And many of you have heard of, uh, has been in the news, and I think mentioned by, by Jerry and others, is Shifa Hospital, which is that hospital in the background. Um, that's essentially, you could consider the, the, the government hospital in northern Gaza. Uh, it's the hospital where, where most of the casualties were taken uh, this past summer. Um, and it's the hospital where I spent and, uh, and, and Rich has spent most of, most of our time um, in the past couple of times we've been to Gaza. With me on, the, on, on, on your right is uh, Marwan, who's the chief of surgery at Shifa, and on the right is Sobe, who's the, who's the medical director. And these are the folks who I spent most of my time with and who I've been involved with um, back and forth over the past year or so, uh, hopefully planning uh, some future trips there and, and plans for Gaza. So what is the role of the, of the general surgeon in all of this? And I think it's important just to take a step back um, to where to start, because it's very difficult to know um, where to start and what, and, what, um, and what people want. And I think that's the first point, is, is that there are many things that, that, as an outsider, we can look at and say, this is what we think are, is important. And certainly, that has some validity. But perhaps more important is to focus on what, um, what the people of Gaza want. Next slide. Taking a step back then, there are sort of three things that I think um, we, we as a group, um, from, a, from a general surgery standpoint, have, have to offer. And the, um, I sort of think of it, I guess, as, as kind of three legs of one of the many stools that, that we have an opportunity to help help build there. Um, the first is teaching and training. And obviously, these folks are not quite yet going to be the people who are teaching and training. But that's the idea, is that, is that these are the people, these young boys and young girls, um, who we want to set the stage for, to have an opportunity to, to be part of a, of a growing and a building and a, and a self-sufficient society. Next slide, please. And these are, the, these are the people that are going to do that training. This is the group of surgeons that I work with, um, all of whom have various levels of, of, of training and, and really have an incredible level of expertise. And as Rich said, for the environment that they work in uh, and the tools that they have access to are, are phenomenal. Um, so I think that, that teaching is, is a critical part of of the opportunities that we have there to help. And the wonderful thing about that is, is that's, that's really what they want. Um, the people there now, the surgeons, and I can speak to surgeons and, and, and perhaps many others in the medical community, they, they trained and are well trained, but they learned at a time when, when learning was different than it is now. Um, learning is, there are many ways to teach and to learn that we didn't know about in the past. And, and it's almost as if they're caught in a time warp. And I think that these are very important things that we can help them with, help them to become effective teachers um, in ways that, that we're only learning how to do now. The third part, or the second part, is providing necessary surgical services. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, if I have enough time. Um, because what we might think as necessary surgical services might not be exactly what they think and what they want. And I think that that's important. And then I think the third leg of perhaps what a general surgeon has to offer um, is helping organize emergency surgical services. Um, many of us think, and, and, and rightly so, that, that emergency surgical service, sur surgery and emergent, emergent pre-hospital care is, is not part of surgery, but historically it has been. And I think that there are a lot of things that we have to offer Gaza and in ways that they want help um, to organize their pre-hospital care. So I think that these are the three things that, that in my sort of arrogance, having been there twice, um, I think are things where we can help. And that's, that's where we plan uh, to move forward in the future. So, is teaching, is teaching how to teach surgeons any different than teaching in the classroom? And, and it is. And there's a lot of pieces of surgery that, that, um, that require teaching skills that we never thought of before. Um, 
And I think that these are things that, that, that we do here and things that, uh, next slide please, that they want to do um, in Gaza. So the operating rooms, I, I had thought about how to contrast our operating room experience. And, and as you can imagine, seeing the slides from the previous talks and other things, it's, there's no need for me to contrast that. The resources that are available are, in, are, just, are just different. Um, but the interest in learning is huge. This is, an op, this is, a, this is in last November, and uh, we're doing some laparoscopic surgery. And there were 25 people in the operating room. I mean, it's amazing the, the desire to learn and, and to want to participate and be involved in surgical care. So, so there's a huge desire there um, to participate and to learn. And how to teach in the operating room is a, is a very important part of how to train surgeons. And these are things that I think that we can help with. Uh, next slide. The other part is um, giving residents and, 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 and surgical trainees autonomy. And it's a tough balance. And this is another thing that um, we're learning how to do here still. And hopefully we'll be able to, to learn and teach how to do that in a, in a different environment. Because it's very culturally different, as you can imagine. And that, those cultural differences um, bleed over into so many pieces of their lives, including how they learn in the operating room. Um, these are on the on the on our right hand side is Mohammed, and on the left hand side is Ashraf. And and these are um, Mohammed's a surgical resident. They have a residency training program there, which is which is wonderful because because this is the foundation for them to be able to teach and provide these kind of services to their people. Next, please. And obviously, teaching and, and learning in the classroom is uh, as important a part of medical and surgical learning now as it was in the past. So both of these things together are, are areas where hopefully our group and others will be able to to work together and, and improve their surgical learning. Next slide. The, the contrast I found was, was fascinating. Um, I would see patients in the clinic um, and they would come in with their, it, it's, it's, here we have, we have so much trouble with our medical records. We, we have things in different hospitals in different places. They had the best system there. They would bring them with them. They kept their medical records. It's something that we want to do, and we want to have. We want to have a little chip. But what they have is they come in. They come in with their families. They come in with their moms. They bring everybody in, and they've got all their medical records. We put them on the computer, and we look at them. And it's fascinating. Those medical records include MRIs, angiography, all kinds of incredibly advanced diagnostic tests, um, and. It was easy enough for me to get a patient to have a CAT scan that day. So there's some incredible, um, almost well, inconsistencies, if you will. Next slide. This is sort of this has sort of become sort of a almost a you know kind of a classic picture of of our first trip there. And this is how they were warming up IV fluids in a coffee maker. Um, next slide. Their operating rooms are. A, about 30 years old on average in terms of the equipment that they have and the things that they have access to. And you can imagine what state of repair that they're in. Um, it's terrible. Um, but again, they managed to do things that, that we're able to do um, with so, so much less. Next slide. It's, it's hard to know where you might, and I think we all might have different opinions about what basic, basic surgical services are. Um, or basic medical services. Clearly, there are things that were, that just cannot be and will probably never be provided in Gaza, and that's totally appropriate. But where do you draw the line, or where do we help define, help them decide what services can be provided there? And I think that's an important piece moving forward. Um, this is a laparoscopic tower, we call it. And basically, it's the equipment that's used to do laparoscopic surgery. And perhaps many of you are thinking, oh, great, I can have my laparoscopic surgery here. But is that really basic surgical services? Um, and I, you know, it's a, th it's a thought that, that I think is very valid. But 
my answer to that question is simply yes. Uh, I think being able to provide laparoscopic surgery to the population of Gaza is incredibly important. Um, it might not seem like it at the start because much of it is, is not necessarily life-saving. But on the other hand, these are services that, that, that the surgeons know that they can provide, that they have the skills to do, and that they know are things that are being done elsewhere in the world. So I think that these, there are things that we perhaps may not think of as being basic surgical services, but I think that they are. Uh, next slide. Simply for the reason that it's very expensive to send patients away from there. It's probably far less expensive to take care and to provide some of these services in Gaza itself. And I think for that reason alone, it's very valid to provide and to, for them to be able to provide fairly comprehensive and fairly complex surgical services. So one of our goals um, in working with the surgeons there and what they want is they want to have an advanced laparoscopic surgery center. And I think, again, that is a very reasonable thing to do. There's a lot of resources that are required for that and a lot of training that's required. But I think that this is something that's a valid, a valid need and a valid desire. The third part is perhaps something that, that um, you know, maybe fits more with my, with my area of, of expertise, the, not, the, not the shells, but um, sort of the provision of emergency trauma care. That's what I do. Um, and you may, many of you are probably aware that, that where we live is perhaps one of the best places in the world for emergency trauma care. Um, and I think that, that there are many things that have been learned in our part of the world that, that will be of benefit to, to the folks in Gaza. Next slide. One of the things that we hope to do, and this I think in many ways sort of brings together um, many pieces of this, but, but teaching and the provision of emergency care and the establishment of trauma systems. Um, the, the uh, Bob had mentioned the advanced cardiac life support, and in many ways, the advanced trauma life support has been patterned after that. The notion that, that there are some very basic things that we can do for trauma patients that don't require a lot of resources um, that will save their lives and allow them to get further on in their, in their path towards recovery. Um, we have started the process of getting, of getting the ATLS course um, taught in Gaza, it's, it's, it's a huge process. This is perhaps one of the biggest challenges. Uh, I need to have five instructors. I need to have all of the equipment and the, and the facilities available to do this. Um, so this is, a, this is an ongoing um, challenge, but the, the good news is, is that I have support from the American College of Surgeons and the people who, who can help make this happen. Um, so that is the, is the third part of of this, or the third leg of this stool of providing, I guess, general um, and basic surgical and emergency services to Gaza. Um, and I think that's all I have. Thank you, Grant. You were very patient. And thank you, Danny, for continuing to try to make that work. So I'm going to address the question that I get almost every time we talk about this, which is, what can I do? We feel in this country sort of hampered by lack of power about making a change. There are organizations that fund uh, what's happening in Gaza. The United Nations Relief Works Association recently had to cut back on their funding because they don't have enough money to take care of the people in Gaza, and yet they are feeding 70 to 80 percent of the people in Gaza. It's really a disaster. What we do when we go there is um, any, any money that we collect, we buy medicines, we help take care of a kindergarten. We send money to the cochlear implant center, to the cerebral palsy center, to NAWA, which is 
Do you have that up? Can you get my little guy? You saw a picture of this young man earlier when he was telling us about how his grandmother's house was attacked and, his, and he then spent many weeks dressing um, a breast wound on his mother because she had a piece of embedded shrapnel. He's a nurse. He's a hero. His name is Abud Bayomi. I can almost not tell you this story without crying because we met Abud last April when he was really feeling pretty good about his work. He was working as a nurse. He had just received a paycheck. And he was putting together programs for children to help children feel better about their lives, play therapy groups. And he was just, he's a darling boy. Well, then in July, his cousin's house was bombed. His grandmother's house was bombed. And this little girl's three sisters were killed in the kitchen where his grandma was injured. She, with this little girl, was blown out through the wall of her house onto the street below and called dead when she was taken to the hospital by another of his cousins. That cousin convinced the hospital personnel that indeed she wasn't dead, that she was just in a coma. She was taken first to Jerusalem, then to Turkey, where she recovered her consciousness. She's brain damaged. She walks haltingly, and she um, speaks, but also with some difficulty. But Abud, who lives in one of those apartment houses, turned over his whole apartment to the little girl and her surviving family members and moved back in with his parents. He said, nice to get to know my mom and dad again. <laughs> well, recently he wrote to me, and he hadn't been paid since last April, along with a huge portion of medical people in Gaza and other people who have not been paid. Now, just imagine this, that 100,000 people are homeless. The United Nations is still housing a lot of people, maybe 20, 30, 40, maybe even 50,000 people. And there's no relief in sight. There was a conference in Cairo right after the last attack, and $4.1 billion were allotted. Almost none of that has gone into Gaza. The tunnels that the people of Gaza were bringing in relief goods through from Egypt have been closed. They really are sealed in. But people like this, like Abud, continue to draw us back through the inspiration of their complete, total, loving spirits. Last summer, there were 17 or 1,800 new orphans in Gaza to added to maybe, I think it's 26 to 30,000 other orphans. There is, there's one orphanage in um, Gaza City, Al-Amal. We've tried to help a little bit with Al-Amal Orphanage. And also with this arts and culture center called Nawa in Han Yunus, where a wonderful young woman who is a master's of library science is putting together a group for children to teach them resilience. These kids come in, they learn about their own culture, they learn about what they can do, and then she sends them out into their community to help others. So she's teaching them to be spirits of their faith. And this is the Al Amal Orphanage playground. You can see it could use some help. They house boys and they house girls, and they feed those kids into the community, and teach them how to be part of their community. So I'm telling you today, there are a lot of things you can do. Call your congressperson. Let them know what's going on, what our tax dollars are supporting in many ways. Please tell your neighbors about what's going on. Educate your community. And if you would like to, the staff of Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility has worked hard to support the work that we do. 
Laura, thank you very much. Danny, thank you very much. And so if you would like to contribute to the work of WPSR, we invite you to do that. Part of your contribution today would also go directly to helping us with the work in Gaza. Primarily, I want to thank you very much for your interest and for your love and for your care and for your commitment to making our world a better, safer, more humane place. I send you that, my love. Okay. Okay, Laura, you want to say something about money, how to do that? This is Laura Skelton. Laura is our executive director of Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility. She is um, an incredible human being. <laughs> I see a question already. Yes, well, well, I am angry from what I heard. Why is Israel bombing Gaza? If, they weren't, if we could stop them from bombing Gaza, then you guys wouldn't have so much work to do, right? What's <laughs> Jerry, do you want to take that question, a statement? Why is Israel bombing Gaza? There are lots of reasons that are given. Um, for bombing Gaza. One of the things that we didn't talk about today at all is that there's a natural gas reservoir off the coast of Gaza, and that's a silent war area for who is going to control that natural gas. We, let me tell you that we go into Gaza as a non-political organization. It's the only way that we continue to get back into Gaza. We cannot compromise that because the last time we were there and the time before that, I was told that we were the only American delegations that have been able to get in. Well, we have a commitment to those folks. You know, we really want to continue to go back in. So there are lots of things that you can read about, about, about the bombing. You can read about rockets coming out of Gaza. You can read about bombing going in. I believe since my trip there for the first time in Janu January of 1993 that I have never been in Gaza when it wasn't bombed. Dave. This is Dave Hall, also on our board. And just keep in mind that uh, Israel is the United States' closest military ally. Uh, they're the ones that are helping us build the southern border fence between the United States and Mexico. Uh, and the things that we have done, shock and awe in Iraq, uh, it's mirrored by, and uh, by the Israelis and the Israelis military strategies in Gaza are mir mirrored by the United States. We need to be very careful about blaming Israel when in fact the United States is every bit as much involved in the same sorts of things. Uh, WPSR is involved, for example, in trying to bring uh, to clarity uh, our piece of the action here. 20 miles from here is the largest collection of weapons of mass destruction deployed worldwide anywhere on the planet. One single Trident submarine <laughs> launching one single of its potentially 192 weapons can obliterate a single city, and we sit here quietly, okay, worrying about what Israel is doing to Gaza. Oh, let me go back to that one, though. Go back, Danny. I wanted to show you just briefly that the reason we went into Gaza, that WPSR went into Gaza the first time had to do with this place called Demona which against international treaty has nuclear weapons. We're not unaware of that as an organization, that we still are, one of our primary goals is to prevent nuclear devastation everywhere. And this is a, a hot spot. During the 2014 campaign, a rocket hit Demona. Now the nuclear weapons are underground, but the shudder was heard across the world that in fact, this is a place of great danger. Go to the next one, man. Then I wanna show you this also, because I think it's important for us to understand this. This is the outline of the Gaza region. The black outline is the original part of Gaza, which is the about five to seven miles wide and as long as 25 miles long, as long as Lake Washington. Just inside that black line 
is the line of security that was given after Oslo in 1993-94. Inside that line is the security zone which Israel has taken onto themselves. And inside that line is a security zone that now is comprised of all the destruction that was done in 2014. The numbers vary, but there probably is only about 44% of the original part of Gaza that is habitable. And even that stretches our credulity when we look at it. Thank you. Maxine, and then we'll take your question. Well, I just wanted to uh, add on to, you know, why does Israel bomb Gaza? Um, it's not a why, but the thing to remember is because, as Jerry explained, Gaza is enclosed by the siege. This is collective punishment happening. There's 1.85 million people, more than 50% are under the age of 21. So it's not military targets being bombed, it's neighborhoods and houses and schools and clinics because really literally there's no place for people to go. Do you want the microphone? Um, I have a friend who's in um, Tel Aviv right now. She's Israeli. She tells me that they're as brainwashed as we are about what our governments are doing. I noticed there was one Israeli mentioned in one of the presentations. I think it was a psychiatrist. Or there were, there, it was a psychiatrist. Are there other Israelis involved in the work that you do? We often, when we make these trips, meet with people in Israel. Gisha, which is the Israeli organization that guards the checkpoints, the Physicians for Human Rights Israel, which is very, very active in trying to get through the checkpoints, and in fact, after the 2014 disaster, went into Gaza and did as much care as they could. There are hundreds of thousands of Israelis, hundreds of thousands of Israelis, who are deeply, abidingly concerned about what's going on there, who are dedicated, a whole raft of soldiers called Breaking the Silence. So um, we are not alone in this work. There are lots and lots of Israelis, but we don't hear much about them here. Yes. So um, just to add on to what Jerry was saying, um, I think it's important to remember that the comment is exactly true, that most Jewish Israelis are very brainwashed, as many Americans are, that more than 90% of Jewish Israelis supported the slaughter in Gaza last summer. Now, if they actually were informed, we would hope that number would be considerably less. But I think it's really important to remember that this conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, to call it a conflict even, is a stretch. There is no parity whatsoever. We have one of the strongest countries militarily in the world versus a group of people in Gaza that has no army, no navy, no air force, as you heard and saw, no infrastructure, a government that barely can function, a siege that is suffocating people, and it's into this context and this situation that Israel bombs civilian targets. And so we have to go back, and I'll just conclude with this, that when you have an enterprise that really is a colonial experiment, a colonial project, not unlike apartheid South Africa, they need to preserve their hegemony, their power, and it means, as the Israeli historian Ilan Pape says, that what happens in Gaza is now incremental genocide. And so we as Americans, as you heard before, are incredibly complicit in this. So I applaud you all for being here, and I totally applaud Jerry and the delegations that go, because this is important work. Okay, I, I would never defend Israel for what they did last summer. Uh, 
but their excuse was that there had been several hundred rockets sent in and uh, that Hezbollah is um, acting very, or has been acting aggressively. Now, I was wondering if anybody would respond to that. And I'm not, I'm wholeheartedly supportive of your position here, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonder to me. Thank you for your question. Hamas. Chuck. Um, it, it, um, so um, I, I'm, I'm Jewish, um, which means that I grew up um, believing in Israel, believing that Israel was the safeguard for my people after, uh, sorry, uh, safeguard for my people after, after World War II. It was part of my culture. Um, you know, I think that if, if, if we want to have a discussion about the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict here t this afternoon, this will go on for a long time. Um, and um, it's one of, those, one of those situations that, um, frankly, there's no answer. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy for every person in the Middle East. And, and frankly, it's not just, not just in Israel and Palestine that this is happening. The entire Middle East is, is, is full of uh, hatred and um, fratricide. And these, for us to kind of have a discussion about that um, seems a little bit futile, frankly. Um, as if any of us could really have an answer for these, for these problems. Um, there's certainly... Um, horrible things that are happening on every side. Um, some of the Palestinian leadership is clearly not necessarily acting in their people's interest from my point of view. Certainly uh, the government of Israel is doing some horrible things. And what happens is that people are caught in the middle and what we're about is the people that are there. And what, what we can do as human beings, uh, compassionate human beings, to help people so I would ask if it's all right that we not try and continue this discussion, which feels like it's going to go nowhere, and really focus on um, understanding what, what kind of questions you have about doing humanitarian work overseas, about what you're willing to contribute to help us, about what you're willing to uh, share with your neighbors, about the necessity to uh, do this kind of work. Um, maybe I'm asking too much of, of this audience to do that, but... Um, um, comments. David. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, the Soviet Union fell, uh, some people believe, in response to the citizen diplomacy that crossed the borders, and many folks in Seattle were very deeply involved in the citizen diplomacy movement back in the 80s. Uh, that's what this work in Gaza is all about. You, sir, in the back, you had a question earlier. Do you want to? Yep. Uh, part of it was the Israeli involvement in this ongoing work that you're doing, I was just, and, and that was answered. But okay. the second one would be um, to Dr. Cohen, I, I guess, although a few more things have come up since your last comments. But um, to your original thing with autism and autism spectrum, I don't know where that is actually now in the morbidity descriptions with the, with the DSM. I know Asperger's are not part of it, but I'm just wondering about comorbidities that you are seeing. What, what else is coming up? Because we know so much with epigenetics now is uh, having a big effect on what we see manifesting in anybody that may have genetic makeup for any of these psychological diseases. Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, uh, if, if the question was, was, was some questions about um, sort of the genetic uh, background of autism and, and other issues. And I guess where, where I'm coming from is um, as an advocate for, for uh, children that have disabilities in general, in the broad, broadest sense, and to what extent um, uh, the, the, what we've learned in the West to help um, um, ameliorate those disabilities can be brought to to a third world country. Um, the specific of whether a particular youngster who can't talk 
um, who doesn't know how to relate to people, which is what we see with children that have autism, is, is really the issue or whether it's broader about um, the value of human life, the value of children. And what, what, what I've seen in um, Gaza that, that I see in the United States is that people do love their children and they want the best for them. And so what we're hoping to do is to give a little piece of that back um, to be very scientific about it or to talk about what the causes of this are is I think beyond the scope of our work because that, that requires lots of money and lots of, of, uh, um, lots of energy over a long period of time and, and we're not going there as scientists, um, uh, we're going there as, uh, as uh, humanitarians trying to help uh, people at the one-to-one -one level of an individual family um, or the whole or the larger community. We're trying to do a lot. We have, we have modest expectations of being able to do that, but nevertheless, what we and all of us have gotten out of going is, is to interact with people, um, to, to uh, um, help them solve some problems, what they ask us to do, and to impart some knowledge. So. Um, so I don't know if that really answered your question. We might have to do that as a, as a s s side table discussion. I, I, thought, yep. I resent your saying that we shouldn't talk about the political crisis and the solution. You're going there to do these things because politically we can't stand up and force Israel to abide by UN resolutions, go back to 67 borders, and leave the Palestinians live in peace. Our country does not exist to restore an ancient religious civilization. We could go and restore Alexander the Great, the Persians, the Babylonians, Egyptian civilization. We do not exist to restore Jerusalem to, uh, to the Jewish heights that it was in the time of Jesus. And if we had the guts to, restore, to, uh, implore, to force the UN resolutions that we all agree to, well then we wouldn't have to have you going back there and seeing this misery that's inflicted deliberately on innocent people. So we have to speak out, because if we don't speak out, we'll never accomplish anything. Thank you for your comment. I'm, I'm going to short circuit it just a little bit by saying to you, we are going there and by going we speak out. Okay, other question? Oh, yes. Four. Um, I think that, as Jerry said, uh, there's, there's no bigger group of, there's no bigger group of, of activists than perhaps you see on this stage, except maybe for me. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, and, and I'm going to take, I'm also going to challenge Chuck a little bit here too, because um, we look, we seem to be a very disparate group. Um, autism experts, um, mental health experts, pediatric urologists. But one of the things I think it might be worthwhile for you if you're interested to go back and look at, there's a common thread. And the common thread is actually to think about is toxins. The toxic environment in Gaza is, is without measure perhaps anywhere in the world. Um, many of the things that Rich takes care of and perhaps the autism and other things are at least in part a direct result of the toxins that, that these people are living with and the kids are playing in every day. Um, the, the, the toxins that, it, that these people are existing in every day. And from a scientific standpoint, that's perhaps something that, that we need to pay more attention to. And I think as a group, we can do that. Um, so I think that is something that's central to a lot of what we're dealing with as well. And it may be worthwhile to, to, for each of you, if you're interested, to look at that issue itself. You saw the picture of the little boy climbing up on the mosque, up onto the rubble? In the, sure, in the film. Little boy climbing up on the mosque in the film. And he stands up on the, on the rubble. You saw the little kid throwing stones into the Mediterranean at the Gaza seaport. We don't yet know what that rubble contains, but we are pretty sure it's not good for people. And kids whose homes were, were destroyed are walking on that rubble 
with no protection. And they're living in that rubble with no protection. So we indeed have a very high level of concern about that and continue to talk about that with the people in Gaza who will eventually be testing that stuff. But they're living in it and they don't have much of a choice. She's been trying to ask. I wonder if people are knowledgeable about the fact that the uh, United States National Lawyer Field just issued a report uh, to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and to the UN. And in this report, they stated that there is no justification based on legally admissible evidence for self-defense uh, in the bombardment of Gaza and the Palestinians. We just issued, they just delivered this, and you know, hopefully we will get some kind of um, uh, report back on the response of the UN and the ICC. Well, and it will take some time for that to happen. But if you haven't read that, then look at the NLG website. I would like to ask you to put words in my mouth so that I can write to my congressman. I'd like to say uh, that I just heard nine passionate physicians and an amazing palliative care nurse speak about the medical situation in Gaza and that um, when there's a situation where the UN is feeding up to 80% of the people, something is wrong with our foreign policy. I want no more of my taxes to go to the weapons that enable Israel to put Gaza continually under siege. What else should I say? What, what a fabulous question. What can we say to our congressperson? Well, that... That's perfect, yeah, what you said. Um, so there is the Leahy Act, which is part of the U.S. Arms Export Act, which says that U.S. weapons cannot be used on a defenseless civilian population. And as a couple of people have mentioned, now uh, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, uh, Bet Salem, an Israeli uh, human rights group, more and more reports are coming out uh, now evidencing what happened this past summer in this last war. Um, so clearly, uh, I'll use the term, war crimes were committed with US weapons. So it's against our Arms Export Act. And I think that's um, a really clear, good ask of our US Congress people. Um, and also um, scrutinize where the money's going. The aid to Israel is going to the military, $3.2 billion a year. And we saw the direct, we see the direct results of that and that needs to stop. Um, and then um, I think supporting the Palestinians' right to go to international bodies like the International Criminal Court to investigate what happened needs to be supported. So I think those are really specific asks. Our Washington State delegation, congressional delegation, as uh, progressive as they are relative to the rest of the Congress, uh, are very strongly supportive of Israel. I just wondered, uh, in relation to the autism and the sustainability of what you're trying to do, if uh, I know you've connected with UNRWA, but a lot of the schools in Gaza are UNRWA schools, and we've dealt a lot with UNRWA and with people, officials from the United Nations in Gaza. And I, I just am curious, I just wanted to encourage work with UNRWA in those schools. It seems like that would be a place uh, for the program to maybe become more sustainable, as well as through Gaza Community Mental Health. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. We, we are hoping to be able to work with UNRWA schools. Um, one of the challenges um, is is at, at with challenging internet connections and communications. It's it's um, it's a lot to ask of our host agency to um, arrange all of these things. Um, the 
the internal politics are, are sometimes difficult, but uh, that was our one of our number one contact areas that we were hoping to work with. And to defend myself about the um, <laughs> political act, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't uh, miss this opportunity. I did not mean to say, I did not mean to say that I'm not passionate about the political issues, because personally I am. Um, I just thought that um, uh, I was trying to understand what, what we were hoping to get out of, out of this uh, session, one of which was certainly to, to expand everyone's knowledge about the difficulties that are happening there, but also to uh, encourage you to support uh, the work of PSR um, in its efforts in multiple levels, because um, this is somewhat both an information session and also a bit of a fundraiser. Um, fundraiser. So um, that that's an that's another issue. I'm happy to talk to anybody about the the politics of uh, the Middle East for hours if you want to. I just don't. At, I do have some thoughts on specific things that Grant and I and Rich and Laura and um, Ned and Maxine can do for people in Gaza now. Um, the politics are are somewhat removed. And I don't know personally what I can do about it, except to write congressmen. I'm happy to do that. I've done that before and give talks. That's another thing. But um, we want to, we're, we're hoping to be more specifically concrete about what we can do. out this fall that many of our police forces are being sent to Israel to train, including those in Ferguson, for example. So we can see where some of those things lead uh, and what the consequences of this sort of view of the world is. Um, another thing I wanted to call to your attention is that Omar Barbuti will be here, brought by the University of Washington. Uh, on February 26th, and he is a leader of a nonviolent Palestinian movement, which may be of interest to some of you. So I'll send you information. Thank you very that. much. I'd like to ask a question of medical people. What is it like in Gaza when the electricity is not reliable? Before I ask that question, I'd like to say one thing about might be helpful to the people here to try and understand the situation between Israel and the Palestinians. And that is, if you look at what we did as a country, as a government, to the people of Iraq, and Jerry led delegations there during the sanctions period, and the lawyers on my behalf brought the suit for genocide, and also I wrote a paper about terrorism. When you destroy a country's infrastructure and knock out their electricity, it has amazing, terrible ripple effects. It's what we did as a country, and how many of us as Americans are aware of that and know the kind of crime that's involved to do that as a form of collective function. So if you want to see Israel doing this to the people of Gaza and get angry, well, I get angry too. But I got angry before about what the United States was doing. Does anybody want to speak to the what happens when the electricity goes out too? Sure. Uh, yeah. Well, the the simple answer is uh, headlights and uh, you know elbow grease. Yeah, uh, but obviously it's a much more complex uh, problem than that because it really uh, creates so much uncertainty over what's available. Uh, and when I when Laura and I were first going over to Gaza, one of the examples of when the power goes out you lose some of your imaging technology. Uh, sophisticated imaging modalities like MRIs don't work if you don't have a consistent power source. So there's a group of people where you, uh, we had to rely on plain x-rays. So talk about going back decades in your medical care, that's what happens. Really, the hospitals are equipped with generators, so you have a backup generator that flips on, which is quite different than um, what the people experience, which might be having eight hours of power every day. As a health 
healthcare provider, I think in the hospitals you are somewhat protected, but what is it like to be that medical student who has no power and it usually is off at night when it's dark and you're trying to study and there's a candle or the number of children and other young people that we saw burned from incidental fires, accidental fires, those, those are the things that percolate in more for me, it, and I think all of us, into the public health sector, not just the specifics of the three of us who are surgeons, and that, that's the exciting thing to think, oh my gosh, what do they do when the power goes off? The, the people of Gaza are equipped to handle that emergently. They still, as far as I know, have gotten gas piped in from Israel and Egypt, but smaller and smaller amounts. So Rich and I weren't there on the last trip in November, and I understand from speaking with people that it, the situation was much more dire. But Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to call this our last question, but again, we'll, we do have the room for a half hour or so, so please stick around and, and hopefully you'll get to speak to presenters. Yep. My name is Harry. I'm a surgical resident at the University of Washington. So I've been training under Dr. O'Keefe, and I'm aware of the reason I'm here is because of uh, his, well, he's an incredible teacher, as is, but also his work in Gaza, which is inspirational. Um, it would be a, a real privilege for someday if I were able to go to Gaza and help the people there. But that's not why I'm speaking tonight. I happen to have many family and friends who live in Israel. And uh, I think there's another perspective that needs to be voiced, and also uh, request. The respect of this, my, my, my family, my brothers and sisters are often, um, in fact, they're always under the range of rockets that originate in Hamas and are fired from civilian neighborhoods. I will make no attempt at justifying the loss of life that occurs in um, Gaza because of the Israeli response. I will say that there are good people, many good people, both Jews and Muslims, who live in Israel, who are under the range of those rockets and suffer because of them. Uh, personally, I have had friends uh, that have been murdered uh, uh, by, um, whether you want to call them terrorists, I don't care what you call them, but they've been murdered. And uh, every time I visit Israel, I go down streets where I see um, cafes and bus stops and train stations that have been blown up uh, and attacked and innocent life has been lost there as well. Now, I know there's a lot of emotion in this room, as, as there should be whenever there's a great loss of life. But I would urge all of us, to, instead of acting out of that emotion, because I think that will unfortunately lead to more loss of life, to take a step back and maybe examine the situation and try to understand, as complicated as it may be, how it arose in the first place and what we can do, hopefully, in the long run to make it better. And um, there are many reasons that I can stand here and say I'm proud to be a Jew and proud to have family in Israel. And one of them is that the hospitals in Israel, and I have been there and served with Muslim physicians who have Israeli citizenship, um, alongside of Israeli doctors, taking care of Palestinians and people throughout the Middle East, regardless of their religion. And it's an honor to do that. And those rockets that are fired by Hamas will hit Muslim as well as Jewish communities within Israel, including the very hospitals that serve both those communities. So um, thank you for your good work. I hope to be able to join you someday. But I do think that there's a larger context context to the, the war that we're talking about. Um, all right, I thank you for your comment. I would sincerely offer you to come with us anytime you want to come. Just let me know. It takes a little while to get in, so this next month probably isn't an option, but um, we would welcome you. And I would only ask that you consider that an imprisoned population that fires rockets has a lot of desperation behind them. Um, let me also speak as a Jewish American. Um, Chuck's Jewish, Maxine is Jewish, I'm not sure who else is, but um, I think it's really important for all of us in this room to understand that 
increasingly this is less an issue of a war between Jews and Palestinians and much more increasingly a conflict between those who believe in equal rights and justice for all peoples in the Middle East, Jewish and Palestinian, and those who want to maintain a system of inequality where within Israel, Jews are first-class citizens and Palestinians are not. They're second or third. And where there's a siege around Gaza that's suffocating people and where there's an occupation of the West Bank. And so let me say that within the Jewish community right now, and you've just seen it today, there's a civil war going on. And there is rapidly growing an organization called Jewish Voice for Peace, the largest peace organization of Jews now in the country. And little by little, we are chipping away at that construct that in my parents' generation said, if you're Jewish, you support Israel. What we say is if you're Jewish, you support humanity, dignity, international law, and human rights. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry that I'm going to have to cut it off with so many wonderful questions still left, I'm sure. Um, thank you for spending your Sunday afternoon with us. Thank you so much to our delegates and our speakers today. We are so proud to sponsor the work that you do in Gaza. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to thank Rich Lang and University Temple United Methodist Church for hosting us today.